Uh, really, thank you all for coming out today and supporting the panelists and our program. Um, we're really happy to see everyone here. And I want to mention there's two shows. So afterwards, the uh, on the line painting and print and dioramics of it, sixth floor in this gorgeous library, we also have a uh, book art show from Works from Arts and Corrections. And some of the Felix and another artist, Henry Frank, who's in the audience, have work that's up there, as well as Michael DeVries, the panelist, led a class inside that um, the results from that class are also on display on the sixth floor. And another wonderful thing, the library has supported this show so beautifully and done, I'd say, the best installation I've ever seen of our work. Beautiful framing, beautiful installation. I really want to thank all of them, their graphics, their PR work. Um, and they're doing something really nice. There's a comment book if you have a chance, and it's almost full. They have a comment book outside the exhibit if you're willing and, or to make a comment. And it's all going to be copied and sent back to the guys inside. And that feedback's really important. So please chime in there if you would like. Um, and I also especially want to thank one of our panelists, Ronnie Goodman, who went to the library and got the form to apply for the show. <laughs> and then he called me every Wednesday morning in the three or four weeks before it was due and said, you know, it's due in three weeks. You know, it's due in two weeks. And <laughs> that's pretty much why we actually got the show. So um, thank you, Ronnie. Um, so I first want to just start by introducing the executive director of the William James Foundation, which runs the Prison Arts Project at San Quentin. And this is Lori Brooks, who has a brief word for you. Okay, so our first speaker, oh, Anne, yeah, um, Anne. If you want a calendar, let me know, because I really want to move these along. <laughs> we have a lot of them. <laughs> San, San Quentin calendar. San Quentin yes, calendar. with a lovely shot of a guard tower, so. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, our first panelist is Steve Emrick, whom I've known about 20 years or more, who uh, will give you the brief background, and it actually could be a five-hour discussion, but this will be the five-minute version of Arts and Corrections <laughs> and uh, Prison Arts Project. Steve was the artist facilitator, first a lead artist, then an artist facilitator in that statewide program at a uh, program by the prison out by Stockton, Dual Vocational Institute, lovely name, and then at San Quentin. And when the funding for Arts and Corrections started decreasing rapidly, um, Steve and Lori moved into high gear and sought out funding from the community through Calliopeia, Marin Community Foundation, other organizations, and essentially saved and now have built the program back up. And w besides the satisfaction of that, the Dalai Lama recognized Steve in 2009 as one of 49 worldwide heroes of compassion for that work. So, <laughs> so I'm going to let uh, Steve tell you what he can in a short while about how he saved our program and what our program is. Wow, OK, this is the five minute version. Um, the program was uh, initially founded by Eloise Smith, who was the executive director of the California Arts Council under Jerry Brown's first uh, time as governor. And she had received a request from, um, I'm seeing all these faces that are coming up from the past. Um, she, you know, um, she got a request from inmates at Vacaville who asked for support because they wanted to paint a mural in their visiting room to sort of brighten the environment. 
Um, she was intrigued with that. She contacted the inmates. And from that conversation, um, she supported that. And, and the, the men inside were asking for instruction, people that could come in and show them techniques, um, ways to paint. Um, up until that time, there had been, uh, there's always been art in prison and sort of a hobby program, but it tended to be just, you know, tend to be more like what we think of prison art, tattoo work, um, that sort of thing. Um, men would have one skill and they tended to sort of protect that if they made belt buckles or, you know, wallets, things like that. Um, so to fast forward, from there, Eloise um, worked with Governor Brown. They got some funding. They, um, you know, s established the program in five institutions. Um, they enlisted the assistance of Lar Larry Brewster at the far, I mean, second to the end, um, who did a study on the impact of the arts in the, those prisons. And what they found was that the prisons that had art programs had a, a re reduction in the violence the reduction of incidents, like, you know, where um, the staff and inmate conflicts, um, you know, they, they found lots of cost benefits. He even broke it down to the cost savings um, to have programs like this in other prisons. Um, so eventually, um, corrections, you know, embraced the program somewhat. Um, they then established the program in every prison at that time in California. So they had a position which was called artist facilitator, which is what I served as for over 20 years. And that person was the coordinator at the site of that prison. They would bring in outside artists, and those artists would teach classes, a wide range. We had dance, music, printmaking, um, you know, you name, yeah, drama, let's see, was it book, book arts, yeah. And um, just, I can't, you know, it, at one point we had um, <laughs> artists in residence. Um, I can't name all the different types of arts we had. It was really a thriving and wonderful program, um, which um, continued for about 25 years, I think, until then the funding with the la in the last few years. The funding was cut in 2003. Um, I was at San Quentin at that time, and that's when Lori and I um, found funding to keep the program at San Quentin Alive, essentially all the programs throughout the state disappeared. Um, there were facilitators who continued trying to sort of double duty and they were directed under a different program in, in corrections. Um, we were fortunate, um, the location was San Quentin and we got funding so we continued having artists come in and we've actually sort of, you know, built up the program, we've expanded. Um, so that's kind of the short version of you know, the art program. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce next to me, to my left, um, Michael DeVries, who, um, <laughs> I didn't expect to get emotional. Um, I have to tell you that I'm seeing lots of faces of men who I met inside, and at different times they thought they would never be released. So to see them out, thriving, um, is you know, a huge um, reward for me. The years of frustration of maybe trying to get programs going is, you know, well served. So, and, uh, <laughs> and um, Michael and I worked together in a unique program at, at uh, Dual Vocational Institution, AKA the Gladiator School. <laughs> um, and uh, we, you know, I, I say we because the men there um, and the artists that worked, we created this unique program that had ceramics, woodworking, we made guitars, um, we did murals, we had a fundraiser every year that we would, we made $10,000 annually off of um, the art, the sale of artwork that we gave to a local child abuse prevention council. I mean, it was, um, you know, it was a unique time um, that, you know, I didn't appreciate at the time. But um, it was an incredible experience. And so I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Oh. OK, am I, uh, I guess I, uh, yeah, I'll get a over here. Pardon me. Yeah. Thank you want it? Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, my wife and I, who's sitting here in the front row, we uh, uh, put together a PowerPoint presentation. We just cool. happened to have some materials kind of left over, and we uh, I uh, put this together, so I hope you'll I hope you'll appreciate some some uh, 
Oh, some documentation behind what Steve was just talking about. Uh, a quick thank you to my wife for helping me figure out PowerPoint and the San Francisco Library for having us and obviously Lori and, uh, and Carol. Okay, so here we go. Um, I've benefited from, uh, from the arts programming in the prison setting for a number of years and uh, actually a little, as far as a little documentation, that's an, a certificate or an award from the uh, Prison Arts Project back in 1987. So um, while I was at Folsom State Prison, which was kind of a, you know, a lot of gray tones there, uh, I was encouraged by uh, the contract artist there at that time, Ken Mogri, to get involved in postcard art. So from, from the, those beginnings, I got into other forms of art, but the postcard art served to keep me kind of sane for what, 20, 26 years. So um, this, these are some examples of how I would relate to the people on the outside, kind of keep my balance as far as enjoying time doing prison scapes and also doing things that would kind of take me out of that prison setting. So this is just an example of, of uh, some of the, and keep in contact with the outside world with. Um, I think I'm, am I doing it right? Yeah. Uh, creating art encouraged me to study about it and art and higher education became productive ways for me to do time. Uh, not only did Ken introduce me to drawing, painting and whatnot and uh, postcard art, but he also in, uh, helped me get set up with a couple local community colleges. And so I studied art history with uh, uh, Sac City and uh, American River College, where Ken now is a professor of uh, art history. Um, and this set the stage for my later involvement in bookmaking activities, book art. So uh, distance learning from more than a couple dozen colleges and universities uh, led me to a deeper understanding and appreciation of art and how it can help transform people's lives. Um, lots of school, that helped, helped me do my time productively. Uh, I'm embarrassed, but it's, it's what I did. Um, I also, I, I have to do a quick shout out here to libraries in the institutional setting. They provided me with an awful lot of help and encouragement and uh, I just happened to take a picture of my San Francisco library card and I want to give them a special shout out because I don't know if you realize that you can go out and get a library card here no matter where you live and you can download e-books and, and books on uh, tape, I think, or audio books. So thank you, San Francisco library. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the early 1990s, I was transferred to dual vocational institution in Tracy, California. Um, and it's not surprising that at, uh, at DVI, uh, I ran into Steve and I, I got involved in his program. Uh, service became a third kind of emphasis that was added to my uh, personal program. As Steve kind of pointed out, the men at dual in this program got together to do things that would serve the community and each other. And uh, I, I have to kind of second what, what Steve said about what the, you know, the value of the, art, the arts program there in that it was a, DVI at that time was a kind of rough place in ways and uh, there was lots of racial tension and whatnot. But it, it's, it's significant to know that it, it, everything got left at the door when we went into the arts and corrections program. And uh, uh, Professor Brewster's uh, his report, which I read, I actually have a copy of it with me, uh, early on, and it kind of inspired me to do more to see what I could do to, you know, kind of uh, promote art and education in the prison environment. Um, yeah, these, what people did in the Arts and Corrections program there, and, and I mean, people were doing incredible things, were donated not only to places like the San Joaquin Child Prevention Abuse, Child Abuse Prevention Council, but also to the annual KQ, yeah, KQED, or whatever it was, the auction up in, at, in San Francisco. So what we were doing, we were reaching out to the community doing what, what we could. 
Uh, matter of fact, I don't know, Steve, you might recognize these are a couple of the brochures from the various sales that we had, some of the materials that were on sale, and these are all donated by people in the Arts and Corrections program. Uh, a little newspaper clip that I inmate art to benefit children. So this is, and once again, Steve's the guy behind all this. He, so as far as having a mentor, as far as including the service element in uh, the whole mix, uh, Steve, he's a man. So, uh, and here he is. <laughs> <laughs> this is a while ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We were, <laughs> yeah. okay. and, I, and I hope you appreciate the, the mix of people here. Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah, oh, it was a, I, yeah. And that's me cradling a book. So, so uh, the, by the way, uh, and, uh, and it's really fun for me, uh, Manuel Montoya is here today, and I want to see, he, I, I haven't seen him for 10 or 12 years maybe 15 years and he came in drove all the way out to to DVI to teach uh, mural painting a wonderful individual and uh, really uh, helped us a lot so really good to see you um, those guitars yeah. were made in the program that the men are holding yeah so those are ones they made so. the gu guitar program was a, a special and this is like a little it got cold in the winter at DBI, so <laughs> we kind of we grew extra plumage to keep oh us God. warm. <laughs> but I was honored and, and privileged to uh, to serve as, as uh, an inmate clerk to S Steve, and that means I just did all the run around paperwork and stuff. And so that was a I learned a lot from Steve in that that way. Uh, other strike. Okay, the, the calamity occurred. When was it? About two thousand something or other. Steve left, and it was a terrible, <laughs> terrible <laughs> blow to the to the arts and corrections program at uh, at, D, at DVI. We did everything we could to try to keep him there, but uh, he had to go. And I'm I'm glad he ended up where he's at because he's doing wonderful things down at, at San Quentin. Anyway, this is, a, you know, somebody's holding a big check. Following Steve, we tried to keep the tradition alive of, of doing, you know, benefiting the, the community with raising money from, from things we were producing there. So that's uh, Tom, uh, that's Witt, right? Yeah, Tom I'm Witt. I'm sorry, yeah. Tom Witt. Tom Witt took over. And Miss uh, Graham, Mrs. Graham, she was a, uh, she, she helped out a lot. So... Uh, we, we kept the doors open and we kept the thing alive and, uh, and obviously I mean things were getting rougher because funding dried up so a lot of us were buying our own materials through the hobby shop to try to keep things rolling. Um, Bookmaking, that's, that's, I fell in love, Beth Thielen came in, came into D, DVI and I fell in love with the book arts kind of deal and uh, that's what I've kind of been doing a lot of ever since. All kinds of very books pop out, out books, uh, books for different organizations. That's a Cinco de Mayo book we did a, a quantity of for the celebration there. Uh, just all kinds of different th things. Beth also, I think she uh, she taught marbling. She taught paste paper production. Uh, I still have some paste paper that st I, that Steve made. I actually have a couple of sheets. Of, uh, I'll, I'll sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That'll make it more valuable. Uh, yeah, so uh, books in all different uh, whoops. Uh oh. Okay, I'm fine. back on track. Okay, books, all kinds of books. An exposed spine book. Uh, we incorporated paintings in some of the books. That's a that's a class we got going after you left the Chinese painting oh, yeah. class, which by the way, a cooperating community college awarded credits for. So, and then I, I got a wood design class. We got earned college credits for wood design. So, uh, Steve's a wood design guy. So, uh, block printing. We did block printing. We did painting. We did. Uh, we these uh, the book in the middle there the green thing that's made up of scraps so we took toward the end it was getting a little rough so we were making books out of scrap marbled material uh, block printing this is one do you recognize that the block print that was done by one of your students Steve you know Kennedy 
Oh, was it Kennedy? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Weave art books. We we just we, we went crazy with the book thing, and and uh, they helped keep things afloat. Um, I was also encouraged by the library staff right next door to maybe teach bookmaking and book repair. So if I got to teach bookmaking in there, I got to, uh, I mean, we had to repair books, so it worked out pretty well. And then we got to use their facilities for other classes that we got off the ground. Um, a natural progression because of Steve's mentoring was, uh, uh, and th this is actually work inspired by a UC professor, uh, Craig Haney, who uh, he, he does things, uh, he, right now he just publishes a study on solitary confinement and inmates and, and how that's affecting them. But he's a really good guy at, at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and he inspired us to do a program to prepare inmates to help out mental health care staff so and the bottom line is mental health care staff ended up uh, producing books that were then given to various organizations and uh, really a steam building these guys met once a week wonderful guys just and that was part of my my job toward the end there uh, quick shout out for other friends who after Steve left things were a little rough so we we did get a, a, quite a bit of help from uh, Barrios Unidos, another Sa Santa Cruz-based outfit. And uh, Nane was is big, big on arts. He's a he's a peace warrior. I mean, he's a he he goes into institutions and helps steer kids the right way and whatnot, and, and just to you know maintain instead of getting involved in gangs. Um, Nane is a great friend of the arts. Uh, other friends, I think the guy on the left there lives in San Francisco. That's uh, Danny Glover. And then some of you old, uh, older people might recognize uh, Harry Belafonte. They, they came in, and, in along with the uh, Barrios Unidas folks and helped us with the, you know, with the arts programming. Um, you, you said, I can't say enough about the people at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, Nani brought in Dr. Uh, Professor John Brown Childs, uh, and they brought arts programming in the, in, the, in the form of education about art history as it deals with different subcultures and whatnot. So once again, we, we tried, we used Steve as a template to try to keep things rolling, and uh, we did okay. By the way, this is a, this kind of ties in as a thank you for what they were helped with. The mental health guys made these book covers for, the, uh, for a Cinco de Mayo program to be given away. And these are these are books. Some of the books that these once again, people with uh, and there are a, a conservative estimate is that there are hundreds of thousands of people in prisons in the United States with mental health issues. So these guys got to do this, and it really I think it made a difference. Uh, scrapbook, landscape art. And once again, these guys kind of mixed it up and did some pretty nice stuff. Post parole. I'm out of prison now happily out of prison. Uh, my wife and I still hang out down in Santa Cruz a little bit and do uh, book arts teaching with, with youth groups. Uh, this is the these are the results of a, of a group we did down there. And we also, uh, we, we go on retreats, warrior circle retreats. Uh, Nane is also very big on helping Native American populations, so we kind of tied in some uh, made kits so that we could make books, for, uh, they could produce books. Uh, teaching book, bookmaking, once again, we're back at the library. I do a little bit of uh, bookmaking instruction at a local library. So uh, that's getting to be kind of the, the end of my career uh, with regard to uh, corrections. I do want to go back in one of these days, but I think it's going to take a little bit of doing to get me back in to we'll work on it. Okay, we'll work on it. And, but before, before I st st stop here, I want to give a plug. And, and one of the, the gentlemen from San Quentin is here who has something to do with this. The San Quentin News, sanquintonnews.com. It's a wonderful resource to see how arts in corrections can, and I mean, is working daily. You go to this website and go to the um, uh, back issues, and you'll just, it's incredible the number of programs. By the way, Steve is a, 
community partnership manager yeah so he's you know he's uh he he deals with all the people coming in to help and you got scabs of people helping and it's it's just wonderful i'm just thrilled with what's been done there i think that might be about it so thank you i hope i did take up some Thank you, Michael. Um, I think your talk about service, everybody here, what, um, so many of you are involved in the program, so many of you guys now outside are donating time and service. It's, it's an amazing legacy that gets built up with programs like Arts and Corrections. Um, our next speaker is Ronnie Goodman, who last I heard is a marathoner and a full-time artist. He's a printmaker a painter and um, an advocate for the homeless here in San Francisco. And he has a studio at 440 Haight that you open approximately 12 to 6 just about every day where he has his own work and ha there's some other work there for sale, uh, prints, gorgeous stuff. So I highly recommend dropping by there. Um, Ronnie has kept up an amazing art practice that's a model for anybody interested in the arts. I don't quite know how he does it. Um, but his large piece over in the show you'll see is a, a wonderful sort of statement because he takes older work from inside the prison and is collaged and painted onto a new piece. So it's like that ever-growing evolution through art and change. So Ronnie, thank you. Uh, I want to say um, first um, thank the library for having us here and for showing um, the work of San Quentin artists and various other artists, and also um, Carol for putting this together um, because um, I thought this would be a nice platform for people to um, see, you know, see people artwork and also um, get in touch with, um, you know, um, what's going on um, inside prison and how and how it changed life through the art program um to me um arts and corrections has made a big impact on my life um as a person um that was seeking change uh, <clears throat> in my life um and i met steve um back in the 80s um, and it was through a, um, an art contest out uh, of watercolor that I won, um, and that really helped out. But to fast forward everything, um, in my life, um, you know, um, I've been struggling um, with um, drugs and alcohol and things like that, and I needed something to replace that with and I needed something to, I can show myself that um, I can be much more than what I was. And I launched on to art as a way to save my life, you know, and to really make an impact on me. And through, if you look at my art, it's about my life and it's about my struggles and it's about my change. Um, and I'm still growing and I'm still changing and I'm still struggling and that will never change. Um, I think to me, I embrace change because I used to fight with change. I used to struggle with change and it was like something that um, now is, I have to learn to embrace. But um, going fast forward, when I um, was in San Quentin and got involved with the art program, I wanted to... Um, do um, um, lino cut, and that's when I met um, Katia, um, and I got involved with that, and I learned that, I said, wow, you know, um, I can reproduce my work, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm like thinking like, wow, I can reproduce my work, and, and hopefully it might help support myself um, financially when, um, when I'm released, but you know, as time went on, it's just that I really got into the form and it re I really got into the, the way that how you cut um, linoleum, you know, and to me, it was like, 
it was another change because it was like, okay, I can use these tools, which I never really carved with, and how to, you know, use all these different techniques, and, and you know, just, you know, just to take the time out to, like, slow your life down and to focus on something creative is, um, it was like, it was really important um, for me. You know, I didn't see it at the time, but I really started, like, I'm reflecting on my life, you know, as years goes on, you know, because I can see the growth um, through my art and how it changes and then how I'm changing, you know, and when I, um, I, met, I met a lot of guys in the program and I did a lot of portraits of a lot of guys and I always, you know, when I draw and, and paint guys, I did a lot of live stuff. And I did, when I was in H unit, I always talked to guys and asked them because I see them coming back and forth and they were struggling with drugs and alcohol. And, and when I did their portraits, I always talked to them, you know, and asked them, you know, um, how they doing, you know, and I really start connect with them. If you can look at the painting that I got out there in the show, a lot of them guys, um, you know, they had a lot of pain in their in their lives, and and I seen that, and I just really just like got out got out of myself and just kind of connect with them, and to me, I think that really helped me out because I can see a lot of myself in them, and I can see a direction in my life that I would like to go in and not to um, and not to go back in, you know, and my heart always will always be with people who always struggle with themselves. And all I can say is, is to do the best that they can and because it's a battle that you be fighting and you're gonna fight it for the rest of your life. Um, but I feel that though now since I've been out of San Quentin, um, I've been doing the best I've ever done in my whole entire life. Um, I'm creating art. I'm working with Art Hazelwood, who let me in his studio, which I am so honored and pleased that somebody let me there to print. And he gave me a lot of directions on, on critiquing my work and put me involved, directly involved with a lot of um, community um, um, places like the Homeless Coalition, um, a lot of the homeless um, advocacy um, projects that helps out in the community. And I'm like, I never in my life felt that my art would be used to fund people who don't have anything and to keep the program going and keep people um, knowing about what's going on with homelessness because I think that's very, very important here, especially in San Francisco, because it's, it's all around us. Um, and, and a lot of people who um, are homeless are people who have a lot of issues. And, you know, besides, you know, being mentally um, disabled to take care of themselves and they struggle with life. And the program that I'm involved in, I feel that I'm giving to them and it's like it's, it touched me every time because I'm like, wow, here it is. At one time, I was just like a thug. I was just, an, I feel like I was like, never in my life will ever dream that I can give and give with my heart. And I enjoy that fully. And I think it, um, it always, it always tells me something about myself, you know, because I, I think it's very, very important. But other than that. Um, you know, long, I feel like as long as I'm staying creative and staying focused on what's, what Ronnie's doing, because I feel it though that I have to stay grounded in that. And I think me using art um, helped me and it's, will always continue helping me. So with that, uh, I'm, a, I'm pretty much finished um, what I have to say. <laughs> Every single one of these people is a really hard act to follow, but um, <laughs> uh, the next speaker is Felix Lucero, who, when I met him at San Quentin, 
had, I believe, gotten every degree, every job training program, everything you could possibly do to educate yourself and do well on the outside under his belt by then, as well as being an amazing artist and writer, and I believe he was writing grants to help do programs inside. And just the list is too long, but um, Felix's work is actually, we have a piece out here and, and a piece up in the sixth floor show. And um, I also, as far as I know, Felix is going to be starting at San Francisco State University next year, too. So um, he's just continuing on an amazing role. So Felix Lucero. Uh, well, first I want to say I'm a little jealous. You know, Steve's got his old clerk here. <laughs> I <thought> he <laughs> you know, he's showing him off and all that. And he got pictures. I'll introduce you, Felix. <laughs> I thought it was me and Henry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, you know, I, I went to prison when I was 16 years old. I was, I was 16. I was, I was sentenced to 18 years to life. And pretty much my life was out of control. It was, you know, I have felt like... I lost everything, right? And I didn't even understand what that everything was because I was too young to even figure that out. So I spent, I spent maybe the first, maybe five years in prison. So when you're in, in, in prison, uh, everything is levels, right? You go higher level up. When, when you're in like maximum security prisons, you stay on lockdown. That's pretty much your existence. And I remember I, I was on lockdown probably for like the first five years. Um, I still don't know how I did that. I think about it now. How, how the hell did I stay in the cell for five years? But what arts and corrections did for me, it, 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 it came into my life at a time where I was like really angry. Um, I had a lot of resentment towards people, towards the system. I blamed a lot of people for mistakes I made. And um, it just came at a time in my life where I was, you know, I was either. I was gonna go down one road or the other. I was either gonna be angry, I was gonna be uh, resentful. Uh, you know, I, and I, I was still doing stuff like Carol said, right? I was doing, uh, you know, getting degrees. I was doing everything I needed to do. But I still had a lot of anger. I still had a lot of resentment at the fact that, you know, I had been in prison since I was 16 years old. Um, you know, I looked at myself as a, as a victim for a long time. and. I also always had this creativity. I mean, I, I used to draw, I used to make stuff for my daughter um, since I was young, since I was, real, real, uh, since I was a little kid. And when I, when I found it, I was, I was actually sitting on the yard. I had a job as a, as I, I was sweeping up cigarette butts when I first got to San Quentin, right? Me and Henry, right? Me and Henry, that was our job. One of the best jobs in San Quentin, because right? you, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> But pick up a couple of cigarette butts. <laughs> so I remember I was sitting there. I was sitting there one day. I see this little, uh, this tiny little hole in the wall. It says, San, San, oh, it says arts, arts and corrections on the top. And I was like, yeah, what's that? So I wander in there, and I think, I don't know what, what they were, they were doing something in there, right? And I was like, oh, this is. There was artwork up everywhere. I was like, man, this is like the coolest freaking place in prison right here. So, <laughs> you know, I started going in, um, and. By then, I was just, I, I used to do a lot of like uh, pencil work, you know, I would draw on envelopes, make birthday cards for my daughter. And when I walked in there, it was like all these different things going on music, uh, uh, Shakespeare, like poetry, like, like Steve was saying, it was like an endless list of different ways to be creative, different ways to like express yourself. And when I got in there, it was like an escape, right? It was like an escape from all the stuff going on in the yard. I mean, prison is like, you know, they promote racism, they promote gangs, they promote violence, they promote sexism, all these things that uh, as, a, as a system is like promoted and validated and, you know, they validate violence in there. So when you get in there and, you know, you're with the, a black guy, a white guy, right? It doesn't mean much out here, but in there it's like, you know, you white guy might get stabbed for talking to a black guy or eating together and so I mean I started doing like block printing I learned how to play the guitar you know we had all these shows like we did all these amazing things uh, but I think 
what was what worked best for me in there was that the people I met, the friends I created, like like Steve and and who's you know by law can't be my friend, right? As the rules of prison, but. In that little in that little world in that little room, you know, we ate together. We, you know, that's it was like it was like family. It was almost almost like we were human beings, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like that sometimes, you know. <laughs> but um, so for me, that's what I got. That's what I got out of it. I, you know, and I like I used to love to make books. I send them to my daughter, right? Help me stay connected to my family. It helped me stay connected to like me as a human being. But that's what, you know, that's, that's what that place did in there. And it was, it was really thanks to Steve, you know, he didn't, it's not like these, uh, like these amazing things that you have to do. You just gotta let people interact, like human beings interact. And you know, that's how we are, right? We're creative, we create bonds, we create friendships that, you know, I got friends here that I've known for over 10 years and we're still hanging out. So that's what, that's what Arts and Corrections did for me. I think the art was almost secondary sometimes to the relationships and the friendships that I built in there. And I think I'm done with that. <laughs> Um, uh, you'll have a chance. We'll have questions and answers and a chance at the reception. You can talk to everybody. And I want to make sure we know Henry Frank, who's another ex-San Quentin artist who's out and in the back of the audience and another amazing artist what is here to talk with you, too. Um, but now I want to introduce Rolf Kissman, who uh, a fine printmaker and I think mostly printmaking and now a student at Santa Rosa. And I... I just know that, you know, I think this is a card that we're selling um, for William James that we'll have at the reception. This was one of Rolf's early prints. He just was a natural. And uh, this is called Out. I mean, uh, it, it shows up somewhere here in this slideshow. But um, Rolf just always contributed. He, oh, here, you sure use this print for a card for other organizations for fundraising in the prison. He was always donating work, cards, et cetera. So, um, in the brief while I knew Rolf inside, he was just a very talented and very generous and funny guy in the studio. So um, I want to hear what's been happening now, and thanks for telling us more about All right. Um, well, I've been out about 10 months, so I was taking some art classes at the junior college right when I got out, which, I, which helped perpetuate the art I've been doing. So that's... That's always something I brought home from prison, which I enjoy. And uh, I guess I, it, how I got into the Arts and Correction program was I was Ronnie's neighbor, and he would continually be painting portraits and stuff, you know, up at 3.34 in the morning working and also at night working. And so... I really, he was an inspiration to see he was just so focused on his creations that he was so out of the mix and just doing his thing. And I really uh, admired that, that that's how he spent his time. And, and I bought some of his work and sent it home and everybody loved it. And, you know, it, it was, and it felt good to help him out and, you know, um, then he invited me up to the block printing class. He said, "You might like doing this yourself." So you know, and I and I and when I went up there, I was it was uh, it was just it was amazing, really. I mean that it was nice to have a focus um, away from all the other stuff in prison that I really really enjoyed. It was almost like leaving prison. It was really, I mean, and. And just the fact that everybody was teaching everybody else, and there was always a discussion going on, and um, about you know how this technique or what this was, you know, and then you know, and also at, at, at a point I was able to to you know help other people who are new in the class, and you know show them how this works or how that works, and you know, and pick up habits from other inmates, good habits, 
<laughs> like Felix, I, he was always we keep we try to keep things real clean, and, and I and I and I admired that because it was uh, taught me to just go a little slower and be a little bit more uh, meticulous about your movements and what you're doing, and that I I, I really uh, enjoyed that everybody was just there was really no ego there uh, as far as oh my stuff's better than yours or your stuff's you know it was just everybody was really. Uh, helpful in that manner um, and then really what started happening is I'd set, start sending prints home and to family and friends and that was a really great way to be able to give back for gifts for birthdays and Christmas and and people would really you know they felt like they were connected to what I was going through a little bit more and I found that block printing was a way to express you know what I was kind of going through in the in prison, like the subject matter I take. You know, like what am I? You know, so I found myself wandering through the days, kind of looking at things and saying, "How can I transfer that onto into linoleum?" And and that I spent a lot of my time in my head just doing that, as opposed to thinking about you know stuff that negative stuff. So really, it was just I mean, it's an escape, but it was also uh, it, it was a reflection of what I was going through. So, you know, like when I started getting, I don't know, about a year to going home, that's when I did that out, and that's really where I was thinking out, you know. i got to start thinking out, you know. And then, so, a lot of my work kind of, uh, I think the last thing I did was a, was a, a crow flying or something. So I was like, yeah, I'm, that's it, I'm, you know. And I call it, I think I call it hasty something, but because I was trying to get it done before I left. But <laughs> hasty bird, that's what I called it. So it was uh, really, you know, that was that was almost that was the best time I spent in prison. And really, that's the you know I kind of I do miss it, you know, obviously uh, that part. So just being able to be focused like that. Um, and that's an amazing thing to be able to say, you know, coming from a, a place like that. It's, uh, you know, there's not much light there, but in in that studio there, it was a sanctuary, and uh, there was everybody. There was no hassles there. It was really uh, a good thing. And that's that's about it. That's all I'd say today. Everybody has such amazing potential, and for a lot of people, art is how that happens. Um, so very, our last speakers are a pair for us today, co-authors of <clears throat> The Paths of Discovery, a wonderful book which has more stories from more inmates. Professor Larry Brewster is a professor of public and nonprofit administration at USF, but he's also been sort of a guardian angel for arts and corrections with starting early studies, I don't even want to say how many years ago, but early 80s, and continuing all these years to keep working with our program, keep finding, um, you know, doing these interviews and publishing the book, and now doing new studies with um, several organizations, such as California Lawyers for the Arts and Foundation work that um, is helping us show again with up-to-date figures how great our program is, although it's obvious. But, um, and Peter Mertz is another guardian angel, an incredible photographer, petermertz.com, um, who's been doing for over a decade docu you know, pro bono documentary f photography for Arts and Corrections and Bread and Roses in Marin. And this book has some of the best quality reproductions I've seen in a paper book or a community arts book, and it's all Peter's work. So um, we'll have these across the way at the reception, but I yeah. would like both Larry and Peter to get a chance to tell us about the book or their recent work. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Um, and it, it's interesting, uh, Peter and I have formed a really special relationship, not unlike what I've just been hearing uh, described with the Arts and Corrections uh, program and everyone involved. Um, in the few minutes that I have, I thought I would just describe very briefly the research that's ongoing. Um, we're attempting to uh, continue an evaluation of Arts and Corrections, 
to uh, show evidence of the worth of the program, although as Carol says, it's self-evident uh, just by the, the men we've heard speak. Um, the current research uh, is really, uh, can be thought of as in two phases. Uh, the first phase is what we call a qualitative study, and that consists of the interviews that are reflected in the book that Carol mentioned, and Peter will speak more about in a moment. Um, I've spent about three years now interviewing um, close to 30 uh, formerly incarcerated artists, uh, men and women, mostly men. Um, and it's been an extraordinary journey for me, just having the experience of talking with, with these folks and learning about the Arts and Corrections program through their eyes. And, um, just very briefly, several themes emerged through those interviews that really have been reflected in the conversations already today. For example, I heard so many just say that the arts program helped them to discover things about themselves, or really to discover themselves perhaps, perhaps for the first time, to do reflection, um, and to self-identify as artists, and not just as a number. Um, they all talked about how the arts program helped them to do their time meaningfully, and we've heard that today. Um, what was particularly powerful for me was how so many of them said that the arts studio and arts classrooms were a safe haven where it helped to bridge the racial gap that uh, Felix and others have referred to. Um, some have, uh, through the arts, discovered or rediscovered their heritage, and they all spoke about uh, how important it was for them to give back to the community through the auctions and other functions that we've heard about today. The second phase of the research uh, that we're engaged in at the moment is survey-based research. Um, legislators, governors, um, CDCR folks love statistics, so we're in the process of um, surveying um, both uh, two, two populations, really. Um, <clears throat> those who were involved in the Arts and Corrections program, and we're surveying um, men, these are all in male facilities that we're going into at the moment, uh, surveying men who have never studied art or practiced art. So we have the two populations. The one reflected here that has enjoyed uh, and benefited from arts education and practice, and then those uh, inmates who have not had uh, the experience of studying art. And um, uh, I had a bunch of notes which I'm not gonna refer to um, in the interest of time, but I do, I do wanna mention that among other variables that we're measuring through the survey research are some attitudinal scales, such as how well do they manage time, um, social competence, how comfortable are they around other people, how well do they work with other people, uh, achievement motivation, how motivated are they to pursue other educational and vocational programs, for example. Uh, intellectual flexibility. There's a lot of, li of, liter of research in the literature, particularly education literature, neurology, psychology. Um, there's a lot of evidence about the power of arts, particularly uh, at the childhood level, but all the way through human development, through the inner, uh, well into adulthood. The power of art to help us to be more agile in our thinking, more creative in our thinking, uh, to exercise the right brain in conjunction with the left brain. And, and uh, so we're looking at that as well. Uh, emotional control, how, how well um, do those who are exposed to arts education um, control their emotions as compared with those who don't have the benefit of arts education? And finally, self-confidence. Um, and again, I don't have the time uh, today, but uh, we are running the data, and so far uh, there is significant statistical differences among those who have been engaged in arts and corrections, some for as long as 20 and 30 years, some for as few as 
um, two or three years, compared with those uh, who have not had the benefit of arts education. Um, for example, and this is particularly true with self-confidence and with emotional control uh, in terms of the measurement of those indices, as well as the intellectual flexibility. Um, how well do they think uh, creatively and problem solving, for example? So uh, we're in the early stages of the data analysis. Um, I hope to have an interim report issued uh, in September, and we'll make that available through various websites and other vehicles. And then the research is ongoing, and uh, so we will continue to, to, um, to measure um, attitudinal and behavioral changes, by the way. We are also looking at um, to what extent has involvement in the arts program resulted in uh, reduced tensions between inmates and staff, between inmates and inmates, and in, uh, in terms of disciplinary reports. So more to follow, and thank you. I think we're wrapping up. Uh, here now. How much more time? Just well, a minute? If you want to talk for, you know, like up to five minutes, and then we'll have ten minutes for questions for the panel. Okay. So. Well, um, I'm the photographer of the pair, um, so I was telling Larry before this that I'm not expected to be articulate uh, because I'm a visual person. But I, I wanted to tell you uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, about the process that Larry and I went through in putting this book together. So he had been doing these interviews with uh, former inmate artists for years, and I had been uh, photographically documenting the program at San Quentin for years. And we met one night at Steve Emmerich's house and uh, found that we were both doing these sort of similar well, projects. Comes back to you, Steve. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started chatting with Larry, and we, 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 we seemed uh, to have, you know, to be speaking the same language, and, and we, we got this idea to put something together, his, his text and my, and my photographs. So um, we didn't know if it was going to work or not, because these were two completely independent projects that had been going on uh, parallel for, for so many years. He came over to my house one night. Uh, I had printed out 100 or 200 of my photographs just on cheap paper, little four by five inch pieces of paper. And we said, okay, how are we going to do this? How, we, how do we see if, if your work uh, will fit with mine? So Larry said, well, a few concepts have come out, themes have come out when I look at these interviews and, 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 the, and, and the materials, the poetry and the writing that I'm, that I'm reading from these guys. And you will have heard a lot of these themes mentioned by a lot of the guys now. Um, so, so we put these themes on, on some on some index cards, Larry, and we laid them out in my living room and we started going through my photos, wanting to see if my photos would fit into the categories that Larry had found. And, and they did. They just fit right in like, like pieces to a puzzle, which to me is a testament to, to, the, to the strength and the validity of, these, of these, these categories, these themes. You've heard them before, discovering self, Unleashing the art spirit, doing time, bridging the racial divide, reconnecting with family, self-improvement, giving back. Um, so it, it really became a delight to put our work together and uh, it just seemed so easy to do and we've continued um, expanding the project since then. We finally published this uh, just last fall after working on it for several years together and, and we're continuing to uh, gather more material uh, text and photographs for it. I'll mention one other thing that um, I think s sort of encapsulates the experience uh, that a number of these artists have talked about, which is uh, the many times that I've gone into San Quentin and photographed in the art room there, in, in the art studio. Going into San Quentin, for those of you who've been in, there's a lot of gates you go through, and there's a lot of people. There's thousands of guys in there, some of which, some of whom don't don't look all that inviting, and you can get a lot of hard stares from some of the guys as you're walking across the grounds. Um, but when 
every time I opened the door and went into the art studio, it was a breath of fresh air there. I, I was met with smiles uh, from the inmates who, who had begun to know me. Um, they shook my hands, they offered to carry my gear. I always take a lot of gear with me. They'd offer to carry my gear in and help set it up. Um, and I had heard stories that occasionally there were some pettiness in the art room of, of uh, competitiveness or something like that, but, but I never witnessed it. It was, there was a lot of sharing um, across racial uh, divides, um, a lot of helping each other out. Um, and I heard more than once that room described as a sanctuary. And um, one thing that I witnessed sort of illustrates how, um, how much these guys protected that room and their space. Uh, there was a, it was a, um, a printmaking class, and they work with uh, sharp steel cutting instruments, which is, uh, of course, usually not allowed in a prison, but this, this program was allowed to have these, these sharp tools as long as they were very careful with them and didn't let any of them go missing. So uh, Katja's class one day, and, and um, somebody said, suddenly in the middle of everybody working heads down said oh where's the number two blade and and everybody stopped what they were doing and there was a sort of a collective holding of the breath because they knew that it was the, the program could be stopped for months at a time if that blade weren't found um so there was nervous people were looking around and trying to think who's been in the room and out of the room in the in the last hour um and then here, it was under this piece of paper, and they produced it, and there was a collective sigh of relief at that point, and everybody went on, but. Uh. Down their guard, and being vulnerable and open, or, you know, the, the artists coming in from the outside, and, and, you know, going through the hassle, <laughs> and through the gates, and past the guards, and, and, you know, trying to bring in these blades and things. Um, but anyway, I wanted to acknowledge there's quite a few people in the audience who have, have been inside to contribute to this program, either, um, either as inmates or as uh, artists. And I'd like to ask you to all stand up and get acknowledged as well. So there, there are hundreds of artists who have been a part of this program over the years, and um, I just really am grateful myself to have had this opportunity to, to work with such amazing human beings. Thank you, Larry. So just to give um, Felix and Henry equal time, uh, <laughs> Henry, stand up. And, uh, and <laughs> They were my clerks, and you know, the clerks, they, um, they run all the movement sheets and make sure things stay together. So we had a pretty close relationship, and you know, there are things that do occur. And so Henry was doing all these programs, nonviolent communication and things like that. So there was one day I was getting all mad and upset, and Henry handed me this little card. I still carry it. And, and they were both doing this thing like, okay, Steve, like you have feelings that aren't being met. So now what, what are you feeling? And I'm going, well, I'm not feeling respected. And they're going, yes. And so I have to say, they have helped me through some hard times inside as well. So, so I've been very fortunate. I've worked with some amazing people. So thank you. So we have time for a couple of questions. Does anyone, and of course then more at the reception with the fabulous food that we're all going to across the way at the Latino room. That's what it says on it. Um, <laughs> anyone have a question? Two questions. Okay, in the back. Oh, I just wanted to know, so is this same program um, throughout women's correction facilities? No, it was. When it was run by the state, California Department <coughs> of Corrections and Rehabilitation. It was in all the prisons. Now there is no arts and corrections and what we have is Prison Arts Project at San Quentin. It's not a statewide program. Okay, thank you. Yes? Um, I'm from California Lawyers for the Arts. Thank you. <laughs> state of advocacy that's going on and the 
reception that um, the program has received. Um, if the attempt to restore it, um, we've been working with the William James Association to restore the funding through the state. Sure. It's, it's been really wonderful to work with California Lawyers for the Arts. The last couple of years they, they adopted us basically and have, um, have really taken over the advocacy effort or taken on the advocacy um, on a level that, you know, it's not my forte. Um, so it's just, you know, we've been, we've been going to the legislature, to the, the upper echelon of the Department of Corrections, uh, working with the California Arts Council. Um, and, and really getting some buy-in um, at a certain level. And we can always, you know, we're, we're, that's also part of like wanting to get people on our email list. Um, you know, at some point we're gonna probably have a letter writing campaign and really try to get some, some, uh, some further pressure. Um, but there's, there's some promising, especially the California Arts Council is really interested. The new director, Craig Watson, is really supportive of this, um, of arts and corrections and has committed to to helping to find some funding for that and and actually recently there was a meeting with him Alma Robinson from California Lawyers for the Arts and um, uh, Secretary Beard the new head of corrections um, and Craig Watson said hey I'll put in a hundred thousand dollars if if you will <laughs> so it, you know it's that kind of thing it's like if something can, could shake down and we could start to have more complete funding uh, for arts throughout the state and not just at San Quentin. But we've been really trying to keep the program at San Quentin alive and so vibrant and such a vital uh, uh, model so that we can keep bringing politicians in there and, and see you know, what an what a incredible program we have and what is possible with some, a little bit of funding. <laughs> Sign our list. <laughs> Sign our list. We, we bring in people all the time as much as we can. We have these regular events, the, the Shakespeare performance and the uh, Brothers in Pen reading, and we try to bring in as many people as we can pr have Steve process to bring in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have there oh, okay. We have another okay. So Thank we'll you all for you. coming, and uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere I have a right. nonviolent communication.